don't think. Our path has been very different and I think much more conventional. I think what we saw were um, admirable projects of uh, a great deal of imagination and, um, and ambition. Um, <coughs> I have started um, in, in my group <coughs> in the graduate school uh, following the field as it developed in the last 30 years. And um, <coughs> I think it's good that Jonas finished with um, the question of definitions because I thought precisely because of the wide range of uh, definitions and understandings of the field, it's, um, it's, it's good to start with one. And I'm taking this notion of environmental design. It's a very technical term, actually, that um, in the UK has a very precise meaning, which, which is that it refers to the means of thermal and visual comfort, how we do this indoors or outdoors. And essentially, it was invented to refer to doing it mechanically with uh, heating and air conditioning and uh, artificial lighting. And what has happened in the last 30 years is that we have now converted this into sustainable environmental design and the way in which we purport to be able and want to do it is with natural means. And one of these means, the embodiment of these means is architecture. So that's how conventionally uh, we devise the notion of sustainable architecture. And so I thought <coughs> from that perspective, to talk about the things that uh, that sustainable environmental design is can be expected to have and does actually have so as to confirm from my perspective what is known and what is open to research. I mean it is a well-established uh, system of rules and conventions. I'll come back to this. It is a set of concepts that are applicable both to diagnose and to generate. Uh, it is a critical framework in the sense that there is knowledge there with which to look at projects and, um, and look at them critically. There is the notion of performance very strongly and performance criteria and then around these have arisen assessment procedures that come from different fields. And it is definitely a moving goalpost. It's not reduced to X, Y, Z targets of uh, this or that resource. Some of the rules, conventions, and criteria that the building is a product of crit critical knowledge and practice. I mean, this is very, very helpful in the sense that one inherits this knowledge and, and experience uh, from practice rather than um, <coughs> do it invented in one go. That uh, both the process and the product are open to scrutiny that the environment acts as a form generator, not a dustbin like it has been for too long, that these notions of thermal and visual comfort are now coming into architectural design rather than being engineering add-ons. Time becomes a design dimension. Performance targets come in as something that can be tested and understood. Climate change is a parameter. And finally, the, the urban environment uh, takes priority. In this way, in the sense that the buildings are a problem for the urban environment. They are essentially, wherever we might be, in whatever climate, they are heaters for the urban environment. They are, they are pollutants. And then the city becomes the bearer of a number of different microclimates that affect buildings. So we have a dynamic symbiotic relationship which may not end up being that friendly unless we can um, look after it. How do we engage with sustainable environmental design or design research? Well, the first step in the approach that we take in our program is to define criteria. And the second is to formulate design research hypotheses. 
based on those criteria and also coming from a knowledge of physical processes and built precedents, thereby establishing this base knowledge base that ties in with precedents. And then thirdly, to test hypotheses using empirical and or simulation models, <coughs> which then follow specific rules and conventions themselves. I'm listing these because <coughs> in um, in our program, people come from all over the world, they're already formed architecturally, and, and they have a worldview about how to systematize knowledge. And, and somehow we impose upon that a systematization that has developed through this field. At the same time, students from the undergraduate school come and attend our courses, or I give HTS and TS um, lectures, and uh, they come with their own worldviews and, and projects. And so it's very useful, I think, to have a set of rules and conventions by which certain techniques are applied. Um, here are some, for example, rules of engagement with simulation studies. Well, one first has to decide what processes are to be studied and, and choose the appropriate model, whether empirical or computational, with which to study them. Secondly, there are certain modeling assumptions. The, 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 the sort of projects that we have seen so far are so complex that they would defy most uh, analytical uh, tools that we have. Therefore, one has to decide how to simplify them for the purpose of analysis. What and how to model things. The next is to select what is it that we want to find out what kind of results do we want? In which way do we want them so that we can interpret them to inform design, or to diagnose a problem, or whatever? The third is to make our model believable by calibrating it, i.e. relating it with some reality that we understand, usually in very simple ways. And then we can engage in what we call parametric studies, and or sensitivity analysis. That would be based on varying just a single parameter and seeing the effect this parameter's variations will have on performance. A performance being defined whichever way we had decided to do so. It could be predicting um, in the temperatures. In Anne's examples, it would have been the um, luminance levels indoors or at some specified space, etc. <coughs> the parametric studies in, in the terms of environmental design are in order to investigate. Sensitivity is to see how small variations in a parameter might affect conditions. And eventually, we can settle all of the parameters in, in, in a number of different ways in some sort of let's call it optimization. And finally, we can speculate on alternative realities, uh, which means what sort of adaptive possibilities do we have depending on change of use, climate change, alternative operational scenarios, changes in density in the building over the daily cycle, over the seasonal cycle, and, and so forth. And so based on these, the, um, the sort of pedagogic objectives in our course are, are, are very simple, but end up taking a great deal of time because we run a thought program in which the projects, unfortunately, end up being very short and modest. So first we need to create a knowledge base coming from theory and from build precedents. And just the knowledge the notion of theory is, um, is quite confusing. Where does this theory come from? Well, we, we borrow it from physics. And uh, how do we present it? Well, we have to translate it into something understandable for, for architects. Architects are not stupid, of course, and I, I fully agree with the previous speaker's um, ambitions and um, but we have been the weakest link 
in, in this business, the ones who somehow had to be led by others because either we didn't have the right questions or we couldn't articulate them. And so I think being able to articulate the questions and in fact even partially investigate them as, as, we, s as we saw with the previous projects is very important and that's part of our approach as well. <coughs> I think this is especially important for um, unit projects at DAA that very quickly they become so complex in their formal expectations and ambitious that they become almost entirely non-analyzable. And um, the trick is to learn how to use analysis at a very early stage, in fact before there is a design, a pre-design stage, just to investigate the potentialities. And I will illustrate that a little bit in, in, in a moment. And then learning by doing, as we saw from the first presentation, and then finding an architectural purpose and expression, by which I mean being able to develop our own questions and eventually uh, no longer being the weakest link, but um, having something to contribute as an innovative possibility. <coughs> Just illustrating very, very briefly the, the process of learning of our group, which starts with observation, usually of uh, existing buildings, and learning how to use the tools of the trade. Last year we looked at railway stations as being public buildings. We had more access to them than we would have had in any other building. Um, looking around, seeing how space is being used, the conditions, um, measurement, using the measurement as a basis for modeling and simulation, calibrating the model with the measurements, comparing the two, finding a correspondence that, that allows the student to feel some confidence that the model, the simulation model, the computational model is predicting realistic results, and then using for, in this case, the lighting studies generating design hypotheses, converting them to drawings, testing the drawings. So that's a standard procedure. This year, however, we wanted to go a step further and have access to buildings that normally would not allow us in, that is offices or schools. And we're very lucky in being given a dozen of buildings around London that we could visit and, um, and study, conditionally, but still. And this provided the opportunity now to, to look more closely in how um, <coughs> the measurements could be corresponded with exactly what was happening in the space, both variations in space and over time, i.e. the measurement in relation with uh, how many people were engaged in what sort of, of activity and correlating this with adjacent rooms as well as external conditions. <coughs> looking at the correspondence between the form of the building and uh, the measurements, like here, the way in which the temperature, for example, varied between the, uh, the spaces of the building to this external canopy and then the outside, the effect of these roof lights in the evolution of daylighting inside the space. And then starting to, to feel the difficulty of bringing these things together, that we need at least these three images to start forming some opinion about how different um, aspects of the building may influence its conditions in addition to how the outdoor influences it. And we still don't have the people in there. <coughs> well, here are the people now. And where do they sit? What do they do? And how are they affected by that? A big question in itself, one of the biggest. Um, yet I feel that in looking at how people use space and the control they have on what they're doing as they use space and the influences that they receive, both by the proximity of other people, by the equipment they're using and by the external conditions, I feel that within that there is a heuristic innovative potential for us architects because nobody else is looking at this. For the engineers, this is just a, a little instrument on the wall that will measure things and take all control away from the user uh, based on 
generalized notions of why you should be comfortable with what the engineering is offering you. And other questions, more specific questions, like uh, learning not to overgeneralize. Is the, the coming in of the sunshine in a room a positive thing or a negative thing or a variable thing? And where in the room? And in which kind of room? And for which kind of occupant? And how do we learn about this? Is it reading the textbook that will tell you that? I don't believe the textbooks any longer. And, uh, but it's very important to be able to find a place where either oneself experiments or other people can experiment. <coughs> and here we had um, access in <coughs> some spaces in a primary school and um, <coughs> were able to see in this particular space which is not a controlled um, classroom, but a playroom where you could see easily that people might enjoy being in the sun and then they have the option to go outside the sun patch if they so wanted. As distinct from a space where you don't, ha you don't have the choice of moving around. And then moving from this kind of observations to parametric studies, in this case varying reflections, uh, size of windows, etc., cetera, um, in this space, in order to see how luminance levels would, would vary as a result. Or here, running thermal uh, simulations, seeing, looking at the effect of a single parameter, the density of occupation, which um, this is like um, a sequence of typical summer days in London. And then we see that on certain days, the, um, these changes in occupancy are very neutral, i.e. the temperatures shown by the graph are within the yellow zone, which represents comfort zone, and on other days it's, uh, it overshoots very substantially. And uh, knowledge in advance of this can help us make the space more robust or have fewer people in it. <coughs> I mentioned learning by doing, and we, we, we were lucky in having this collaboration with uh, I think it was it Intermediate Unit 4 run by Mark Hamill a few years ago, and that started us in being interested in, in doing small structures, and, and this was an outdoor classroom for a primary school, village school in Ghana. <coughs> and we followed that with a small structure um, <coughs> that was meant as an archaeologist sor sort of shelter that uh, could be taken around by two people, a very lightweight structure, just barely more than 50, 100 kilos. This, this one um, was a more effective sort of structure environmentally. We did some measurements. Uh, <coughs> if you look at the, um, at the temperature on the grass there on the ground, compared to the grass outside, which gets the sun, and I advance the time from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, you already see a very substantial difference forming. And the grass we consider as a cool material, yet uh, it has reached a very high temperature, whereas the, the grass on the ground under the canopy has stayed more or less at the same temperature. And um, this is a lesson that one has to see it, one has to experience it in order for it to sink as a result. And um, the way in which the structure does that is very, si is, oops, it's um, very simply because its canopy emulates the, the, the sun movement uh, for that location. <coughs> and here this next structure became more mobile. The, the idea was to make it more adaptive to the um, um, needs of the occupants. It, we called it the heliotropic bench. There it is, tested abroad. And um, we brought this structure in, um, in the EcoBuild exhibition. And, um, and I think this was a cunning move, although the, the structure is now rather tired, ha having been around for several years. I think it was a cunning move on my part in uh, getting the students of this year interested in something like that. So the students of this year had to reconstruct this structure. It was first made by students of the 2004 and 5 year, and thereby declaring that they can do much better than this one, given an opportunity and some money from the school. Um, 
Here's our, uh, the, we, we, we also showed the model of the other structures here, small model, and uh, a little panel with three projects that I will very briefly introduce. They do not compare in any way with what we've seen so far. They are very modest, and uh, I think they, um, I'm using them here to show some very simple things. This particular uh, project, which is uh, an MR dissertation project that was completed just uh, a few weeks ago, um, you can read these objectives on, on this slide that it wants to create a device or a roof, a sort of roof light that never allows the sun to go inside within between these hours um, for the climatic conditions of Bangkok in Thailand and, um, <coughs> and develops an architecture around that. Um, it is perhaps simplistic, but it, it demonstrates very uh, clearly the way in which some knowledge of environmental principles from the outset and the use of analytic techniques at very early stage, it, it actually happens well before there is any building because that device can be developed in uh, a generic sense, can be simulated for with a generic room under and then the building can be developed and uh, the roof can be populated by a series of these devices and the performance will, will be retained. And I think this is the value of this approach, simplistic as it might be, that having done very simple analysis early on, we can have some confidence that our, our formal speculations later uh, will maintain these performance attributes rather than go very quickly into complex form and then discover that analyzing it becomes either arbitrary or extremely difficult. There's a lesson there. <coughs> this next project, which uh, was completed as an MSE dissertation project just um, at the end of September, is very interesting for the following. It converted, translated everything that the textbook might tell you about a certain location and its climate and a certain constructional approach and its value. Um, it converted everything into this manual um, as a design guide um, for social housing in um, Costa Rica, a particular setting of Costa Rica. And finally, uh, this one, um, which was completed a couple of years ago as, as an EMARC uh, dissertation project. This is a very clear hands-on, only with the difference that it's not the hands of the student. The student has devised the construction manual, but it's empowering um, <coughs> the self-builders, the self-builders on the hillside uh, settlement around Kabul in Afghanistan to do their own building and in fact to develop um, their own industry using ship wool. That we see a student is back there now working with them. So to conclude, um, as I imagine for all my other colleagues, each year is an evolving pedagogic experiment. Um, it's my view that sustainable design opens new horizons for education as well as practice. I and I think the uh, the three presentations before have are an excellent proof of that. And that reaffirming uh, architecture's ecological route is an alternative, provides us with an alternative to other trends that we see of digital formalism and high-tech add-ons. And um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Here we're getting towards the end of the uh, cycle of of presentations. Uh, I think just two more to go. I'll try and be brief. Uh, recapitulating something which Simos and I did yesterday in the uh, EcoBuild uh, exhibition. Uh, and um, I think it's really great. It's fantastic that the AA took part in this exhibition. And also, as we're hearing from all the different speakers, uh, emphasizing very strongly there is not a singularity about approaching environmental issues, sustainable issues, the response of architecture to it. There's no, there's no sort of magic solution. And, and a school like the AA is, is so 
important because of the variety and the complexity of responses to that. And it's uh, a tremendous, I think, resource for everybody that uh, we have this sort of variety going on and develop uh, discussions and conversations coming out of that, which is uh, extremely important. Um, we'll be collecting together images from the exhibition and people can look at them uh, later on. Of course, uh, cities are always the problem. Uh, they're always unsustainable. Uh, on the other hand, they're essential uh, and we're not going to do without them. Uh, and so this sort of information is you know, becoming a truism and it's very difficult to cut through this and say, well, then what do you do about it? It's, you, know, you can become completely paralyzed. Uh, clearly, changes in environmental policy, uh, changes in the technical performance of cities uh, are going to make a huge difference and we're getting better at that and there are a huge range of expertise within the AA actually looking much more at the technical resources. The technical performance in itself uh, isn't going to be... Uh, enough, we have to link that to both uh, social and economic sustainability and rethinking of the idea of the productive city, the city uh, as a place of the reproduction of, of knowledge but also the reproduction of human living conditions, not simply uh, as an exploitation. That will mean that spatially we need to think uh, much more carefully about the future of the urban fabric. Uh, much more adaptable, we have to think much more about the idea of what we mean by workspaces, what we mean by living spaces, uh, and uh, the old and often terribly overused idea of mixed uses and rethinking the way in which uh, we can live and work and mix activities together. Of course, cities have always been extremely differential, have evolved quite differently. Here are four world cities, London, Paris, Barcelona, and New York just to remind us that human ingenuity creates completely different patterns just in plan, never mind once you start to look in section and the assembly and, and concentration of built form and the relationship between built form and space. Uh, and this is not something that we can take for granted. In our work, we do a lot of comparative work across different countries, uh, uh, investigating and then engaging with the transformative processes within the urban condition. Uh, this is Shanghai, one of the most dramatically changing cities in the world, where we just finished a three-year research program working uh, with the university and with the city government in Shanghai. One of the principles behind our work is that we work directly with uh, elected governments, with uh, local uh, investors, and uh, with local populations, where there is a process of dram dramatic transformation already happening. Uh, and so that uh, we also uh, insist that we don't arrive uh, as sort of architectural tourists for one year. We just go in there, do something, and walk away and make, make some, uh, some nice uh, images of it. Uh, we commit ourselves to at least a three-year cycle of engagement, which allows the social and political uh, mechanisms of debate to start to engage with proposals of work. So there's nothing really different between what we see here and what we see here, both cities with uh, an extraordinarily complex built environment with very difficult questions of adaptation uh, and with ways in which uh, the political and social circumstances of the performance of the city uh, bang up against the physical structures, uh, what we already have and how we're going to build new. Uh, and you can't isolate that out. You can't, as an architect, say, I'm just going to make the most beautiful, wonderful building. It has to be engaged within the political and economic uh, conditions. So if we are trying to talk about sustainable urbanism, of course, everything at uh, base relates back to, to climate change. And at, at last, that message is getting through. Politicians are beginning to get the message uh, and, of course, architects ha have had the message for a long time. It was significant, for example, that Ken Livingstone, in the last three years of his uh, role as mayor of London, uh, uh, put a new rule through the mayor's office that every single policy coming out of the mayor's office, the first line of that policy is, this policy affects climate change response of London in this way. It was a, a precondition of every policy statement coming. 
uh, it's the first time that a, a mayor of a major city in the world have actually taken that position, that we cannot simply say, well, no, somebody will deal with climate change or it's the department that will deal with it. It is fundamental to everything. What we've seen already this afternoon is the immense uh, importance uh, of research being done about technical performance, about uh, urban space performance, about materiality and new materials, uh, about consumption and waste cycles. Uh, the history of that work goes back uh, 15 or more years uh, and is now becoming very mature. In our work, we're related, uh, relating particularly to the spatial implications of the challenges of rapid, rapid econo economic and social change. Uh, and this requires us to work in a multi-scalar way uh, and across multi-sectoral uh, parts of, of the economies. Three uh, themes of current research are around the potential of urbanized innovation environments. Most cities in the world are rapidly uh, promoting innovation environments, science parks, this type of way to kickstart their knowledge-based economy. They tend to put them outside the city and they tend to put a wall around them. Uh, we are convinced that those uh, interventions to make new forms of economy, new forms of employment, new forms of research must be fully integrated and part of the urban fabric and the urban condition uh, not separated as uh, separate places. The second uh, field is around the whole question of density, the idea of urban intensification. The density in itself is not interesting. What is interesting is the mix and complexity and interaction that you get through the intensification of uses within a city. Thus, now back to Shanghai, to uh, persuade the city government that in investing in a major science park, they should bring that into the heart of the city and build it in one of the poorest areas of the city and engage with the existing very dynamic local economy rather than putting it again outside the city at the end of a tube line. Uh, and thirdly, the whole question of informa in informality, irregularity, poverty, it doesn't go away. Uh, every city in the world is exhibiting increasing differentials and discrimination it's a, a deeply political question, but it's also a spatial question and a question of design. You can do quite small things. In London uh, in 2007, for 24 hours, uh, Trafalgar Square was turfed. It dramatically changed the climate of Trafalgar Square. It became very habitable, but it also changed immediately people's response to that space. People started to picnic there. They started to imagine uh, London as being a very different sort of place. So even little things like that can be very important, but they're not I in, t in themselves terribly significant. What is very important and increasingly being discussed is that in the uh, future economics of the world, the competitiveness of cities and the desirability of cities in a competitive game is going to be increasingly important. So therefore, something like this uh, signals, and it was done by a promotional organization for London's tourism, signals some element of competitiveness. Peter Hall, uh, the urbanist who, a colleague of ours who works at University College, has indicated four key sectors of contemporary uh, uh, competitiveness that is essential to successful cities. One, of course, is the financial and business services. The second is political power, what Saskia Sassen calls command and control centers. And of course, in, in the, the world, you have three absolute centers of, of those, command and control centers, London, Tokyo, and New York. And between them, they control pretty well all of world financial movements and a great deal of decision making. But that is changing very fast. Cities are repositioning themselves, uh, and in the current meltdown, uh, there's much more opportunity for change. The third of Peter Hall's indicators is the growth of media and creative industries within the economy of cities, uh, fundamental shift from old production to more knowledge-based uh, uh, economies. Uh, and fourthly, a huge generator uh, for cities is tourism and culture. Uh, London's economy, the second largest element of London's economy is tourism and culture. So we have to pay attention to those things, to the spatiality of those in terms of the reproduction of the city. 
There's a very interesting group in Loughborough, you may already know about them, the uh, Globalization and World Cities Group, who've been looking at the way in which uh, you can categorize cities, not by population size, not by GDP, but by what they call the advanced producer services. So they're trying to indicate how cities are competitive uh, in the very rapidly changing world conditions. To do that, the advanced producer services for them are obviously banking and finance, uh, the legal services and uh, financial support through accountancy, and again, media and the creative industries. So when they start to map those, you get what you would uh, imagine, uh, a typical cluster. You get uh, on the eastern seaboard of America, you get New York. You get almost nothing else in America. You get a huge cluster in Europe. The smaller, older cities of Europe, on their measure, are extremely competitive. They're actually adapting much more rapidly. They're learning how to bring in uh, knowledge-based industries. Uh, they're reusing their space and their buildings in a much more effective way. And then you get uh, in Asia on the eastern seaboard of China and, of course, in, in Tokyo, uh, the established centers and new centers rapidly growing. So they start to categorize those into a sequence of, of alpha, beta, and gamma cities. It's not surprising that the three old ones are still up there in the alpha, London, New York, and Tokyo. Uh, but there is no guarantee that they will be there if we do this exercise in 10 years' time if we stick to those criteria of the success of cities adapting to the knowledge-based economy. Uh, one of the ways that we work uh, with students, as well as doing uh, a great deal of research uh, and uh, written work, is that uh, students engage in design workshops throughout the 12 months of the MA. Uh, the theme over the past couple of years has been this theme of urbanizing uh, innovation environments, uh, and I'll show two examples from last year's work, one in Whitechapel, uh, the other in uh, Hanoi. This is very intensive work, working in studios. When we're working in uh, overseas countries, uh, in Hanoi, we, we always work in cities of rapid transformation. Currently, we've started a sequence of workshops in Hanoi. We work there collaboratively, so we always combine with an existing university, and students from that university join with us in an intensive studio. So it's also an exchange process between the different ideas and concepts coming out of very different cultures, which is a very important part of being sustainable long term. It's no good having our own ideas and saying, well, we know what to do. We will tell other people what to do. It must be a collaborative uh, exchange process. So this is very intensive. Uh, it's uh, hands-on. Uh, and it produces a, a vast amount of work in a very short time, which then has a feedback loop straight into the politicians, and in this case, the investor, uh, an international investor who is about to build a biotechnology park in Hanoi with the most dreadful initial proposal for how to do it, which we, uh, he quite openly said, we, I want you to be a think tank to criticize this proposal, which we did. <laughs> We're going back again in April now to take the next steps of what we might do to propose something better. So there's a lot of debate, a lot of presentation, uh, and a lot of feedback. Uh, first of all, though, let's have a look at Whitechapel, uh, where the two great corridors of the London Plan meet, the Thames Gateway and the London Stansted Cambridge Corridor. They, they hit London, uh, they coincide in the East End, just to the east of the power center of the city of London. London is extremely difficult to work in because of its institutional frameworks, and it's one of the things we're interested in is the political and institutional structures that allow change to happen. You've got 32 local governments and the city corporation. On top of that, you've then got the London uh, mayor and the GLA. On top of that, you've got uh, the national government. So actually making any intelligent decisions in a city like London is very difficult. It's very different from other cities which may have far less institutional structures but have immense difficulty also in making decisions. The fabric and patterning of the city is random uh, as we've become familiar with in London, very different from uh, other cities. Uh, and how one begins to read that and engage with that is extremely important. Uh, endless plans are done. On the left is a, a formal action area framework for this area of the city fringe. Uh, and on the right, the beginnings of a very different sort of unfolding uh, done by students looking at the patterning 
uh, of deforming uh, of the deformed grid in the area and begin to read the area very differently to, from a conventional master plan. Sorry. Then one group of students identifying uh, from uh, their initial studies uh, an area around uh, in the c in the centre of, of, of Whitechapel around the station, uh, looking at the uh, uh, contrasts and inequalities. Uh, the Whitechapel station will become a major crossrail station, so it will suddenly change from being an almost neglected tube station to being one of the major crossrail stations in London. Um, this will have a huge impact uh, on the area. It also allows the possibility of bringing together what are at the moment completely fragmented parts of this uh, uh, East End uh, to something more concentrated. We have here a major hospital, the London Hospital, uh, a major university, London Metropolitan University, uh, a huge cluster of creative industries, none of which uh, co collaborate with each other or, or even uh, sometimes acknowledge their existence. So this group of students then was using this, the train station as a concentrator and a generator of exchange between those different institutions uh, within Whitechapel. Uh, so they start to study how you can then st stack up on top of the crossrail a much more complex, very intense urban piece which acts uh, as uh, a generator for the area. And that then, the thinking of that then spreads out into a broader uh, networking, a green networking uh, from that uh, project uh, down towards the railway viaduct and through the city to, to begin to link up other smaller knowledge-based clusters and centres of small-scale production within the area back to this new uh, generator in the centre. So that was one model. A uh, lot of work done on the whole relationship between public and private space, uh, which is in increasingly questioned, as well as the relationship between living space and working space. Those separations are very uh, much more questionable now than they used to be before. Another group looking at the potential of London Metropolitan University, LMU, which has a very big campus in the area, to rethink its space as a public realm. So this work was starting to take a trajectory, you can see on the right there, a trajectory of space unfolding through the existing buildings and existing spaces. Uh, in each case, providing security for the university through electronic controls, swipe cards and so on, but encouraging and allowing local businesses, local population to move through and activate with the university. So it became a design exercise about opening up a public realm within uh, the existing buildings and then inserting key new buildings that act also as hubs within that structure of rethinking LMU. Uh, and LMU was rather interested in this idea. They're currently looking at reorganizing their campus in the area, selling some land uh, and consolidating around the hospital site as well. Uh, and a third group looking at um, different ways of understanding uh, the creative industries, the clustering that exists now, how that can be supported both spatially and economically uh, uh, and reorganizing uh, using certain sorts of diagnostic tools of the local quarters, how they work, uh, the differentials between areas, um, and, and so on. Uh, I, mean I haven't got time uh, to go into details of this, so it's really, I'm afraid, just snapshots of some of the sorts of ways of, of thinking. Uh, we've now shifted a little further east into the Lower Lee Valley, an area under tremendous pressure as the Olympics starts to take off, we hope. Uh, and uh, which is a typical sort of backyard area of the city with a lot of dumping of stuff, uh, tremendous potential, but at the moment completely uh, locked into very negative thinking or very blocked thinking. Uh, so it's there between the Olympic Games site, the existing Canary Wharf site, uh, the XL and the Royal Docks site uh, to the east. As I said with the map of London earlier, of course, one of the problems is that everybody thinks they know what should happen there, but nobody's actually doing anything. Uh, and so we have all of these different organizations who claim, yes, Lower Lee Valley, we're the ones responsible for it. So as we start to have these discussions, we find it's incredibly difficult to actually get any sort of focus on who might be uh, able to take any initiatives. 
from the local government right up to central government. Everybody says that they're doing something, but actually nothing positive is happening. In Hanoi, working in the existing fabric of the city, it's a rapidly expanding city um, uh, of great intensity. Uh, the model that's now being chosen by uh, investors uh, and supported by the city is uh, the worst type of generic glass walled uh, tower blocks to replace uh, the uh, typical four or five story existing fabric in the city center. So there's uh, increasing demolition uh, and the replacement with these completely unsustainable buildings. The biotechnology park site that we're working on is just to the uh, west of the main city, so the city center is here, the river winds through, and then the designated site here uh, is just outside the uh, center of the city. Uh, you can see there the space has already been cleared for the first stage of this project, surrounded by paddy fields and small villages. But uh, once you get onto the road system, about uh, 25 minutes from the center of the city. So very central, but at the moment, very peripheral. This is a very typical patterning of the rapidly expanding cities. You have this very rapid expansion of the center. At the same time, the hollowing out uh, of the center and the building of uh, often completely inappropriate buildings in the center. So here we are within 25 minutes of the center of Hanoi. Uh, this is the site. So uh, one, of the, one of the issues that uh, students picked up on immediately was the uh, uh, failure of the urbanization process. Looking at these, th these are pockets of new urbanization currently developing between the old city and the site in this zone here where the main road goes up to the airport. Uh, and this is the sort of monster that is now appearing there. It makes sense to the investor. It makes sense to the politicians. It doesn't make sense to anybody else, but it's happening very fast. Either this type of generic or this one, sort of uh, new urbanism on steroids, uh, which are gated communities springing up all around the city. In this case, an Indonesian investor doing a pri totally private project, again, with absolutely no relevance either to the spatial structure of the city or the sustainability of the project itself. This is the uh, in investor's initial master plan, uh, the most uh, worst, the worst type model of the sort of generic uh, science park with little buildings blobbed around within some token green space and a park in the middle. Uh, so uh, our starting point was to tell the investor that's not the right way to do it. Uh, and to, to his credit, he said, fine, now let's see what you can do. So then a whole range of debates about engaging uh, the site, never mind the details of the design of the site, starting with actually how that can be pulled back and re-engaged back into the fabric of the expansion of the city. Uh, so both pulling green corridors through and transportation corridors through, linking up with a network of existing research and development organizations in the city uh, so that the site is no longer seen as an isolated part of the city, but is actually a, a growth around the existing villages uh, that connects back uh, to the city. Um, another group here, you can see that drawing the problem in a slightly different way, uh, but looking in this case at a sort of whole uh, active corridor between the old city and the new site. Uh, and placing that within a clustering, these are indications of existing knowledge-based knowledge organizations, either universities or research centers within the city, and how they can be uh, connected through uh, both physically and um, in institutionally to link our site. So our site uh, no longer a peripheral site, but becomes a very central site. Uh, the beginnings of studies of new forms of block clusters and intense clusters that would get away from that patterning that we saw in the original. Um, so one new mapping of the site, uh, allowing for points of intensification to start within the site and then grow from that uh, uh, an urban district rather than the vacuous proposal of, of a science park 
model before. Another group starting from the point of view of a green corridor that would link the whole of the site area together and down to the up, up to the river in the north uh, and seeing how that would then generate certain lines of first step development to be built on in the future. So a very, very quick run through uh, two different cities, two different sorts of project work uh, uh, and back to this uh, principle really that the work uh, uh, has to engage uh, at all times both with the spatial uh, and the detailed design, with the multi-sectoral and multi-scalarity of design. You can't pick off one little bit and say, well, let's do this. Uh, but as Jonas was saying earlier, uh, it's also about the collaboration and the exploration between different groups. It's no, uh, nobody can do it all. Uh, and what's one of the great strengths of the AA is that there are so many different people focusing on different bits and uh, meetings like this are very important in terms of trying to get the conversation going across many different groups. And we'll now, uh, I hope, at the end of the afternoon have more of a conversation on that. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Very short slide. Um, my name is Carola and I've done, um, the project I'm going to present is a research project done within Emerging Technologies and Design, which is a course as you all know, conducted in the Graduate School by Mike Weinstock, Michael Hensler, and Akil Lane. Now, the title of my research is Aggregation, Geomorphodynamic Microclimates. I'm going to get back to the, what all that means in a minute. Um, the presentation is structured just for you to know where you're sitting. Um, as follows, I'm going to introduce the overall idea, show you the context of the work, some case studies, the main hypothesis that I've been um, establishing, then, which is quite crucial within MTEC, the methods that we're using or that I have been using, then the design development, which is very related to what we've already seen, material studies, a design application, and of course, I'm going to attempt an output of the research. Now, um, just to present the core idea of the project, nature processes large amount of aggregates. We've already seen that with Jonas in the sandstone project. Um, and the idea is to use these um, dynamic processes of nature in order to actuate semi-natural dynamic morphologies, which can work both on an architectural and an environmental level. Now, the context. So in order to establish the context of the research, I'm going to take the title as well. Um, so the first bit is geomorphodynamics. Geomorphodynamics um, refers to the dynamic processes of landscape formation. Um, on the right is the process of stone turning into green. Um, and it studies the different influences, the physics of how those landscapes work. A microclimate, um, I mean, climate has been around all day now, and usually it's referred to quite large processes. Um, scientists, or the, the basic paradigm, is that it is broken down for macroclimates, which is the largest bit, to mesoclimates, which is regional climate, to microclimates, which actually refers to what we as architects do, which is in the range of 100 meters and below. Now, um, in order to define what I'm talking about, a geomorphodynamic microclimate then is the conscious modulation of geomorphodynamic processes in order to modulate climate. Um, and on the one hand, of course, the geomorphology will be affected and altered and um, hopefully also modulated in a desirable way. And on the other hand, um, now architecture can be, and it has been throughout the day, understood on one level as a climatic intervention. And in that level, those um, modulations are also or can be an architectural um, intervention. Now, the case studies that I've been looking at um, were on the one hand soft engineering. There are techniques around within engineers to use um, landscape or methods related to the already inherent um, processes in landscape. This is the Dutch coastline. They're basically um, throwing sand in order to uh, into the water in order to protect the coastline and the coastline changes. Yet these all only remain on the landscape level and never cross over to an architectural statement. The second case study was um, how dunes modulate air. What happens is that um, a dune forms a low windward side and a steep slip face 
and thus formed the wind protective area. So this is actually a dual morphodynamic microclimate, the modulation of a climate through a geology. These are continuously adapted due to changing wind conditions. And um, these processes are in nature actually also frozen um, through natural sedimentation or cementation processes resulting in sandstones. Now the hypothesis now can be refined um, using this idea of establishing semi-natural uh, dynamic environments um, into several sub-questions. Um, on the one hand, um, how can these work both geologically and um, architecturally? Then how can these um, processes and modulations have both loose and solid phases? Um, the third one being how these um, interventions can work um, within the cycles of erosion and accretions, the buildings or interventions, as it were, constantly recycling with nature. And the last one being how, in this process, construction material and energy is mainly or only divided by nature itself on site. The methods, I will keep quite short because we're not within the course content, but um, since MTEC is relatively young for geophysical modeling, this has been different. Um, I have uh, made an investigation of what, how can I model aggregates. Um, there is digital modeling, discrete element modeling, which is very interesting, but still in its, um, shall I say, per se, and it requires very heavy computational techniques. Whereas physical modeling of aggregates is relatively easily accessible, very rapid, and very telling as to how the material might behave on site um, and in, a, yeah, in any realistic so I've decided to work only with physical models. Then, of course, issues of scale come in. As you can see, this is the transformation of a sand pile into a morphology similar to that of a dune, which is the basic principle and reason throughout the process. Uh, it, is, um, it is a scaled model, which in aggregates is possible, but one needs to, of course, be careful that not all statements can be transferred. And I think this goes also for what we've seen with Marco and Claudia, that they have now increasingly started to work with one-to-one -one models, which is what you really do need to do. Um, and then, of course, these can be formative and analytical processes. So you can start to understand the material by using the material itself. I'm going to get back to that experiment later on. Now, the design development phase. Um, first started out with establishing the actual sedimentary environment I'm working in. A sedimentary environment that shows um, a consistent um, physics, a consistent sediment basis that establishes physical morphology. Throughout the world, there are many. The alluvial fan and so forth, there's a whole um, taxonomy of it, and they all have different logics to it. I decided to work with beaches, coastal beaches, um, this assembly just shows how, though having the same morphology, changes in sediments, changes in subtle changes in climate, for example, ice versus sunshine in Mexico, can vastly change the behavior of that environment. Um, and this we're also going to get back to, but um, just to introduce that now, the basic beach profile. Um, is quite crucial, of course, because only if you scan the very microdynamics of an environment can you actually interact with it. So a beach basically has a backshore, a foreshore, and a dune um, uh, field. I'm going to show more. Now, the first bit was to actually go on site to Jeff Gill in Germany and to do <laughs> on site modeling um, in order to establish which, which principle does work. Um, and I found out that a pile, which is um, just a regular sand pile, does start to transform into the morphology of a dune, which has a wind protected area on the lee side. Um, this is the, the same, and it's hard to do size experiments because it takes very long. You have to wait for the right wind. This wind was good, and it showed me how it works. Um, now, I took this and put that into the laboratory, which is obviously a lot easier to work because you can be rapid, you can rearrange, you can go wrong, you can redo it. And it allowed me to um, establish different relationships, like crest to crest distance, groups of piles, and so forth and so forth. The most relevant bit was this one um, to establish the actual wind distribution in the sand field. 
using two colored sand where the um, darker sand is the lower layer. I'm going to show the video because that's going to show it easily. Um, then a lighter colored sand is applied and it's taken away only where the wind is impacting. So you can see exactly where the wind, uh, where there's actually wind protection. Now, um, since I also wanted to work with solidified phases within that, I established a solidification method using, um, um, again, an aggregate, a sand cement layer, which can be distributed in a dry phase onto the sand, hardened by rain or spray, and thus solidifies any state you want within this loose aggregate field. Um, the, in the end, I tested on site an additive method which uses the wind actually applying the sand and cement on the um, modulation, and that actually freezes it. Now, the system that can be established, uh, well, we all know that we do tend to work with systems and aspects, which have, have a very basic logic of a boundary, an input, and an output. In this case, um, the boundary obviously is the planet, the input modulation and solidification, which leads to a continuous cycle of formation. Now, the design application has already said that um, I'm been working in Zill. Zill is in uh, Germany, in the North Sea, and it has quite a precarious situation. It loses about 1.1 million cubic meters of sand each year. So it rapidly erodes and will probably break apart as soon as big. On the other hand, it's super popular within Germany and has about 800,000 guests a year who want to inhabit the beach. Now, um, so going briefly a bit more into the morphological or geological processes, what happens is that the sand is swept around the island and is actually collecting on the top and bottom end. So they are actually thickening, which is where I decided to work because I thought that, I mean, of course, they're trying to put petrol codes and whatever to protect the island, but I think it's better to use what is already happening and to start supporting the thickening process at top and bottom. So I've been working in the north in Lis, which is the northernmost point of Germany. And again, now we can see the beach profile very clearly, which is the dune, which has um, the aerodynamic processes, the ripple zone, the flat zone, which also has aerodynamic processes, but no sand collection yet, and the wave zone, which has mainly hydraulic processes where you, you just can't build anything there. Um, or you, you could, but not in the way, not with the methods I have used so far. Um, now, the proposal for the site is to establish an artificial dune belt, which on the one hand serves to slow down the wind through the um, establishing a higher surface roughness. On the other hand, um, to introduce um, beach inhabitation for visitors. What they do now is to go for wind protection into the natural dune field. Um, and the idea is to extract them from the um, natural dune and to invite them into the artificial dune for wind protection. Now, the system now works on two scales, the landscape scale and the um, sort of more um, human scale-based uh, modulation. For the rest, it more or less remains the same. Also, now that we have a site, we can start to establish clear boundary conditions. So it has about seven main wind directions, which allow to refine the test. Um, and to spec specify, obviously, tile, height, tile, um, modulations, and so forth, and to work in an operative way with the system established. Um, this is an overview of where, in blue, the new dune field will be, the, the proposed dune field. And this shows the modulation that I've been actually using, those um, six tiles on the top. Now, um, the geomorphodynamic microclimate that actually came out of that was my small te scale test, whether the system and how the system can work. Oh, fine. Ah. <laughs> OK, it goes up. Flexible system actually, 
that as it were always stuck to the um, present special rule. And you know, the uh, third study was the study of solid spaces. So you can see the Polish study, which was introduced, does not change methodology. It only does public relations. So you you can actually better negotiate with your causal adaptive uh, modulations in the risk class and um, Fermi. to understand that in the Celtic project the first thing is the relationship between nature and architecture where people assume that architecture might not always be architecture and this assumption of course might not always be natural um, on the other hand what you would also see in this market as well that, that you really have to know who you're speaking to next when you're speaking to people um, almost I mean I wasn't here for four weeks and already that was the shock you almost have to spend a year or I'm currently writing a book called Master Planning Futures, 
um, on um, attention and somebody threw green custard over our <laughs> business minister, Peter Mandelson, this morning. Um, she told him it was custard before she did it, but I'm thinking that just as the eco-protesters are realizing that they need to go and s sit on the Houses of Parliament, they need to sit on the runways, they need to do these things that uh, give them five minutes of airtime mm. in the media. Uh, I think it's inc incredibly important that uh, the research-based work carries on being um, proliferated within uh, different cities. And therefore, you know, the projects that were at More London certainly were very brought in a wider audience. Mm. And I think that, you know, academic institution can create this threshold <coughs> to the wider world mm. by so many different means. Mm. So, uh, Simons, what would you say about what is yeah. it that we want to take from the recent uh, advances in the past? Yeah, I have. And what do we want <coughs> to leave behind? And maybe we're cl more clearer about what we want to leave behind. I have three things that um, I'm taking from the past, both my own and um, and the field. And one one thing is to do with this computational, with the use of con computational tools, which um, about which I'm very optimistic. Not so much about their use or abuse, but of going beyond them, because I think that by systematizing their use along the lines that I described, one can exceed them very quickly and replace them with with an informed intuition to the let's say, a new knowledge of what sustainable architecture is in the sense that um, all the architects have a sense of what architecture was for them, whatever architecture it was that they were talking about. I think we can do that. But uh, like we train in Eastern philosophy, you know, you have to follow discipline. One also has the discipline of the computation. Uh, it's a learning process. That's one. The, the other two things that I've learned are to do both with nature and with tradition, with traditional architecture, and that concepts, the concept of adaptation, which is now scientific, well, since Darwin it's scientific, but um, within our field, adaptation is part of adaptive strategy, what we call adaptive strategies, and also the, co the, the fundamental concept of adaptive comfort, the adaptive model in, in, in the notion of comfort, as, as something that fluctuates in a natural way rather than as a fixed point. And the other concept which has uh, become very important for me and which I think can be validated is the concept of transition, which um, expresses itself very clearly in traditional architecture and uh, which we put forward also in, in all of our projects. Because transition is part of adaptation, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you, you can't jump from one state to another. Um, and uh, it came to me in a very strong way and to, to my students when we were in uh, Dubai and uh, where you experienced 45 degrees outside and 22 degrees in the air-conditioned building. Mm -hmm. And by this very fact, you don't want to move from one to the other. And by not wanting to move, you allow both of them to be destroyed by mm -hmm. uh, the very odd coexistence. Uh -huh. um, I think one thing that has... Uh, emerged um, both in today's conversation and in the research the last few years is the issue of agency and the um, the way that these green policies and, and green strategies are administered um, and that it, um, in that in the what you've what we've observed um, in sort of the, the role of the government versus potentially the role of non-governmental the NGO non-governmental organizations the community organizations and so trying to set up this relationship between the government the non-governmental In a sense, we have to empower the kind of micro agencies, um, and we've seen that in, in so many different kind of recent examples from the election of Obama, who kind of motivated the grassroots networks, community organizations, and tapped into their interests and their abilities, and had that grow up to become a larger force. Um, and we saw that in the Urban Aid Conference, where it was a shift. Richard Sennett was talking about how it was a shift from sort of a macro plan into real these kind of micro projects initiated by self-government, non-governmental organizations to start their own projects, like we observed in the favela in, in Sao Paulo, where three years ago we were working with the housing department, who have, put, who have made some great changes in the um, favela, but what we've observed is really these self-grown organizations, and if we can really find a way to meet, to meet to, mm -hmm. to engage and to educate at both scales, um, then they can be very productive. Um, 
so I think that's something that's emerged um, in, in, the, in our learning process is the engagement with micro ethnicity, not only as a kind of a singular voice, but then how we as architects can make sure that we bring Polynesian strategies not only at the macro level of a government policy, but also at the kind of structural and long term within our core community organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't catch your name. Do you, would you like to comment on this? Well, maybe from your own personal um, own personal approach as a young architect, I mean, what observing the last 20, 30 years, what you know. <laughs> 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 well, well, too young. <laughs> well, I, I said, no, in the sense that it's always really good to have an understanding of the context, cultural historical context from which you have evolved you are part of an ecos uh, ecosystem, aren't you? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch your name either. Dennis. Uh, well, as uh, the other speaker, there is another project in the uh, Jewish Foundation that I can't talk much about it, unfortunately. But as one of the guys that worked on the wall, I think our report on the area is not as vast as uh, the other person uh, talked earlier. So we, we focused on production and how to optimize the design through production with a uh, better knowledge of the technique. Um, I think as a designer, we need to know more about the possibilities and to what extent we can use the technologies we have to talk about to optimize the design because there are many parameters that we can uh, control that we couldn't control before with all those digital production techniques and we can actually have lots of material so we can measure it more than we could before. So that's a way to, to produce uh, whatever, I wouldn't say whatever design we want, but to, to have a wider range of possibilities within our designs so mm -hmm. we can actually achieve a better control of what we are doing. Can, um, can I add something? Oh, sure. Uh, I think that for me there is a, uh, an interesting point about uh, the, the technology in itself, no? and, and the way actually technology sort of percolates through the design environment and effectively also reaches this kind of micro agents or you know if you want the, 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 the sort of local communities and so on. I think that there is a, there is a, a kind of issue there uh, for me because uh, in a way there is a kind of you know mobile phones and uh, way of reaching people which uh, has been kind of diffused so vastly and so quickly and uh, but on the other end there is uh, I don't think there is a kind of parallel diffusions of methods to use this technology in a way that is kind of truly empowering and, and somehow can kind of really give a kind of strong feedback uh, to, and, and I think that's a little bit the difference between thinking of technology as a gadget or thinking of technology as a, as a kind of real instrument of, 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 of kind of development. No? And I think that somehow these exercises and, 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 you know, and what I think uh, the kind of design school can do in that sense is really about trying to push uh, a much uh, quicker uh, kind of percolation of technologies uh, to, to, to everybody and then somehow um, you know using them in a way that kind of 
there is a, a kind of possibility of feedback from, from the users, uh, which is immediate and strong. And I think that's a kind of really need of, of our society somehow to be quicker and more clever and more efficient in, in the translation, in the use of technology into, into a kind of uh, paradigm that becomes kind of really uh, empowering, rather than just somehow, in a way, how can we say, kind of reducing the user to, to kind of a dumb uh, kind of, a, you know, gadget. Or th I think that's, uh, for me, it's uh, quite important. And I think some of these exercises are interesting in that way. And I, can, I think it should be pushed a little yeah. bit more. Well, al also, what is fundamentally clear is that a lot of them are inventing whole new programs. I mean, not wholly new. They're not uh, reinventing inventing something we haven't had before, but they are intervening in breaking down the, uh, the anachronistic nature of typologists. So mm -hmm. as typologists have become anachronistic and in engineering terms, the programs are deficient, you are actually finding fundamentally new ways of, uh, of yeah. new ways of not, moreover, not just solving problems, but new ways of operating in the world. Mm -hmm. And, and communicating in the world that serve a cultural purpose rather than just get from one A to B or yeah. um, uh, just deliver an, one message alone. Yeah. And that, that's what's so great, yeah. that actually all these systems, they're all very specific, and it would be terrible to create some sort of artificial homogeneity. But I think that that's the great yeah. heterog heterogeneous um, uh, advantage of the AI. Just we have just like one minute. Oh, he's got <coughs> one minute. Thirty seconds. I, I, I think what was uh, striking for me today was that um, I, I looked at the possibility of collaborative potential in a much stronger way than than, than in than in the past. So I think mm. this session serves very well in terms of you know in a very short period of time to have this concentrated exchange, mm. which then hopefully starts each of us thinking about how we can bring the the, the strengths together. Um, which I hadn't considered before, I must say. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just uh, on that, uh, one of the things uh, that I think is happening is we're getting away from the sort of fetishism of technology as something that mm -hmm. architects are fascinated with to a much more serious underlying discussion. Mm -hmm. And we have powerful new tools. I think that's something that's coming out of all the units, the, the new tools of actually working on ideas and of going right through to publication mm -hmm. and one-to-one -one scale is very powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we have to be careful that that doesn't itself become fetishized as you know, architects mm. making pretty things. Mm. And that's why getting back to Mandelson being, being covered in custard this morning, <laughs> that you know, protest movements are really important. But our trick is to turn from protest to proposition. Mm. We're actually saying you know, there are tools to do things differently and to really push that so politicians are no longer sort of resisting the protest and saying, well, these people are a nuisance, they're mm. complaining about runways and that thing actually saying, no, there are new tools, there are whole new ways of thinking about it, mm. and, and that's uh, something, that's the next step, I think, that we have to take. Yeah. Well, we should be yeah. finishing. <laughs> Nick has a question. <laughs> <laughs> when are you guys out of here? <laughs> you can email your question. Can we email? Do you have an email, a dialogue forum? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Of course, you're in the yeah. office. Yeah.